time. Um, okay. Welcome everyone to this event. It's been planned for some time. Had a, had a technical hitch last time, but uh, thanks to um, you know our technical team, we have finally managed to schedule this uh, wonderful webinar on blockchain security, best practices for Cardano DAP hack proofing. Right. So we have got an amazing set of panelists. Uh, Maximilian, who's from M Labs, uh, you know, he's he's the Plutus uh, lead there, and uh, you know, uh, he he's been responsible also. He's been interacting with us in many different ways, helping us to sort of uh, get our um, academic curriculum, etc., uh, really industry standard. Uh, then we've got Roberto Morano from Gimba Labs. Yes, Bharat, um, I think. Uh... As as you keep doing, I think uh, there is a there is a panelist introduction out there going on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so maybe there is a request. There is a request for. Yeah, so we'll keep the suspense for, till later. Yeah, no, yeah. There, there is a request coming in for waiting for another five more minutes from one of our batch, which is undergoing the class. So, ah, okay. So maybe we so, could just wait till uh, thirty. So then then we go on. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. So just, we'll, uh, I think they might still require a couple of minutes after that to join in, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So they're just requesting maybe the the trainer will leave them a few minutes early. There is a leeway, so uh, just give us five minutes and then we will ask a uh, you couple know, to start up the event. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Bharat. Thanks. I have, an, I have a, uh, just a fun little question for you guys. This is actually for Roberto. I, I'm always a little, I've heard the name of your company pronounced as Gimbal Labs, but I would almost pronounce it as Gimba Labs. What's the proper pronunciation? <laughs> I'm glad you asked it because there is, a, there is something hidden in the name of the, of the organization. It's actually Gimbal Labs. Um, the, the name is um, to make honor to Cardano and uh, his uh, specification of the gimbal, which is this artifact that uh, is used today uh, in, in stabilizers for cameras. Uh, he specified oh, yeah. it. Sure. Um, so yeah, we, we wanted to, to, to use that uh, as, you know, play with it. And, Hide, hide, them, uh, hide it in, in our name. Excellent. So we, we could have these conversations uh, because we always pronounce it like Gimbal Labs and then yeah. you come and ask <laughs> us and we can tell the story. <laughs> I love it. Excellent. Uh, yeah, a very, very good So day. it helps you maintain your balance. Exactly. Yeah. It's about finding balance in so many... So many dimensions, right? Security, decentralization. Mm -hmm. That's what yes. we are working on. Okay, I think uh, let's let's for the benefit of time. We already have a lot of questions to be asked. We've done a pool of questions already with Bharat, and Bharat is trying to see hey, which to take, which not to take. Let's go and people can keep coming in. Uh, over to couple, uh, the delivery head. Let's go Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks so much, Manakshi. Thank you so much, everyone. Warm welcome once again to this beautiful event, beautiful day for blockchain security best practices for Cardano DApp hacking. I would like to welcome all the guests, Roberto, Maximilian, and Philip. Hi, everybody. And all the dignitaries from the Moko family, Sebastian Pavan, Bharat, Manakshi, Sebastian Pereira, Roberto and Jonah to this beautiful day. And also I would like to warm welcome to all the attendees who have taken out their valuable time for attending this event. Thank you so much. And I believe the success of this event lies when we all together, you know, contribute somehow for the success. Thank you so much once again, everyone. Now, with all your permission, I would like to start this event. I would like to go to the agenda. Agenda is as follows. So first, it would be a welcome to the gathering. So already did by a couple, myself. Then I would be handing over the baton to Jonah, who is a lead academic community, for introducing the panelists and also taking head the conversation with, you know, face-to-face -face chat along with that. 
Then there would be a 75 minute face-to-face -face chat that would be followed by Q&A with experts. And that session would be moderated by our CTO Bharat. And then we will have a very, very uh, beautiful session on about a kidney happenings for the month and our launch of our exclusive Discord channel that you know everybody is waiting for. Last but not the least, there would be an insight and the invitation to join the Emmer Way Academy Company. So I would like to hand over the baton to Jonah. Jonah, all yours. You can start the event. Thank you so much. I wish everyone all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Kapil. Thank you very much. Um, would you advance to the uh, community slide, number three, please? Excellent. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. I just want to uh, give a brief introduction to the Mergo Academy community, uh, just to let you all know uh, what we're here for and what we're trying to do in the Cardano ecosystem. So the Emergo Academy community is a voluntary global community of blockchain enthusiasts. And we believe that together we will empower each other and together we will scale the adoption of the Cardano blockchain. We work uh, towards this uh, with four guiding principles in mind. Uh, first, we are building relationships between members of our community. Uh, second, we are representing and advocating um, our common interests with respect to Cardano. Third, we are establishing new perspective collaborations, the exchange of ideas, technologies, and experiences with respect to the Cardano ecosystem. And fourth, we want to bring value to our community members through focused technical Q&A channels on the Cardano blockchain technology. We also provide access to Emergo Venture funding for entrepreneurial building on the Cardano blockchain. And we also have academic learning vouchers, which can be used for skill building or Cardano related programs. It also invites you to master classes related to Cardano ecosystem and development, and also blockchain expert AMAs on all subjects related to Cardano and development on Cardano. We are here, we are heading towards building a enormous 2,500 plus member community focused on evangelizing and supporting the entire Cardano ecosystem. And your joining as part of our community has taken us just one step closer to achieving this. If you have not already join the community, please take a moment to join our thriving community on Telegram, Discord, and Twitter. We'll post some links uh, in the chat, but then also um, later on, you will see some QR codes uh, if you want to use your phones to uh, join our community. So, well, would you advance to the next slide for me, uh, Kapil, number four? And this will be our QR codes, everyone. So these are QR codes. I'm gonna pause here for just a minute in case you guys wanna get your phones out, click those links and join our community right now. If you don't have time, we will uh, be showing these again at the end. So uh, take a moment here if you can. All right, that's your moment. Uh, let's go to the next slide now, Kapil, slide uh, five. Great, so here we are, I just wanna introduce you here. This is the um, Emergo Academy uh, Steering Council. And on the council, we have um, all members of, of the Emergo Academy. So we have Sebastian Pabon, who's joining us today. Uh, he is a governance council member, Emergo Academy. Um, he's also a, a CA, a VCA, a CT, and a funded uh, proposer on Project Catalyst. So if you guys need to know something about Catalyst, Pabon is the man to talk to. Uh, he is also in charge of our Catalyst technical channel uh, on the Discord. So if you join our Discord and you have questions about Catalyst, Pabon will be there with office hours uh, in real time to help you address any queries you might have. Next up there is me, I'm Jonah. I'm community lead uh, at Emergo Academy. Um, DMs are always open if you guys need uh, any information or want any insights about Emergo Academy and the community, please come to me. Next up, we have Sebastian Pavon. Uh, Sebastian Pavon is a technical channel lead uh, for Mergo Academy community. We are going to be launching that channel today. So very exciting. We're all very excited to have this up and going. Uh, at the end of this seminar, uh, the channel will go live and uh, Pavon will be there. I'm sorry, Pavera will be there uh, to help you out with any sort of technical challenges you might have with uh, around development on Cardano. And then we have uh, Sachin 
who is our uh, marketing lead. Um, so all of the marketing material you might see out there on the web, on Twitter, uh, is coming from Sachin. Uh, delighted to have him on the team. Uh, he does excellent work. And we have Kapil. He is the livery lead. He is the master behind the scenes. Uh, he makes this ship run. So we all give a, a great thanks to Kapil for all the, all the things that he does behind the scenes. Uh, you want to move to the next slide for me, Kapil? Excellent. So I'm going to uh, let uh, one of our other experts here, either Pabon or Pereira, talk about this incredible event that took place recently. Um, do you want to take it over here? Just give a brief uh, talk about what happened at the hackathon. Yes, I think we would request Pabon to speak about it a little because it was a great event, a technical event sponsored by Murbuk. So we would like to have Pabon to speak a few lines about the entire experience. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Uh, in the past uh, weeks, we had uh, we support uh, an event in, La in Latin America named the Cardano Hackathon in Argentina. That was a great uh, event because we we had the, the, the presence and the work of many uh, figures in the in the in the Latam ecosystem. Uh, it started like, uh, for example, the uh, Jose Aiziko that he has uh, he has a, a project in in Catalyst based on uh, ener clean energy, based on solar energy. It's a really interesting project. Also, uh, in the event, the, the event had uh, personalities like, for example, the Dr. Lars uh, Bronges. Um, people from other ecosystems, for it's for Bitcoin ecosystem and other or, 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 uh, other networks in general, and people from Latin America and from other uh, other um, industries interested in, in start to work in in, in, in Cardano. That was really, really, really interesting because we had the, 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 the congregation of students, professionals, teachers, and many, 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 many areas in, in, of the real life in general, of the real world that was really special. Uh, and a good effort and, and uh, uh, an example of the kind of efforts that we as a Morgan, in general, we as a free catalyst or as Cardano, intend to, to, to make to make the, the lives of the people better in general, lives of the communities and the countries. And we, we have to think big in general when we try to make the, the, the good of, 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 of the world. So this kind of, of events are an example of, of that effort. And that in, in basically that, that was the idea. Maybe can be a simple hackathon, but was a great, a, a great work for uh, Jose and uh, Solar and all the, the, the guys in charge of the project. And we had the, the, the honor to be in that, in that event. And we hope uh, participate in other events in the same line. Excellent. Thanks. That, that's yeah, thanks. Thanks for the quick note. Yeah, I don't know. Over to you, over to the event. I just uh, thought it was fantastic. I just want to mention that I think the winners of that event got some uh, academy classes or something. What was there was uh, that's pretty exciting. So, uh, so if you know if you if you join a hackathon and you win a hackathon, you can upskill right here at Emergo Academy. And yeah, I can do, I, think... I, I can say, I can say with clarity, the students are really happy with that opportunity. They're really happy to uh, learn and, and get uh, uh, a more technical uh, knowledge about, about Cardano. They are really happy and very, yeah, I really think, uh, Definitely take this opportunity to know, congratulate all those winners because it was a very beautiful event. And I think at the top, uh, two participants, uh, three of them have been sponsored for a complete Cardano developer professional program that makes them a lot more empowered and do a good job, right? Looking forward to such participations in various events by Academy to bring in the goodwill to all these like-minded, right? 
Thanks, Pabon. Thanks for bringing up that opportunity for us. Thanks a lot. Yep. Yeah, I think we're back to Luna. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next slide, please, uh, Kapil. I just want to uh, bring everybody's attention to um, uh, below on your Zoom screen. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with Zoom. I imagine most of you are, but we have um, a chat window down there, and we also have a Q&A window. So if you have questions that you want to ask our panelists, uh, please put them in the Q&A window and we will try to address them um, in the order in which we receive them. Uh, some of them we might answer live and some of them if we can, if they've been answered, we might just uh, answer them as a chat, but please do participate there. Um, we are also um, can bring some of you up to stage if you wanna ask uh, live questions as well. So, yep, I can see we have a couple of questions coming in. Thank you, Cristalvo and Francisco. That's excellent. Um, and there's also a raise hand feature. So if, if uh, you're you're having trouble getting getting our attention, try raising your hand. Um, but these are all the functionalities that you'll be uh, using um, to join us. Okay, we're going to start everybody muted and video off. And so, like, if you do want to ask our panelists, please raise your hand and post a question in the Q and A section, and we'll be happy to get you up. Uh, next slide, please. Excellent. So now we're going to introduce our panelists. This is very exciting. We are really, really uh, lucky uh, to have uh, these excellent um, folks with us today. Uh, first, we have Maxi or Maximilian uh, Brodak Brodowicz. Sorry, the Polish names are hard for my. my tongue. Uh, no, that, that's that's cool. That's cool. Uh, Maximilian Maximilian Brodowicz. Uh, sometimes I myself get confused. Excellent. Thank you, Maximilian, for correcting that. Uh, he is of M Labs. Uh, he holds a dual degree in mathematics and computer science. Uh, Maxi developed backend services in Haskell for VoiceLab A.AI, which is a technical. Uh, he was also a technical team lead at IOHK, where he worked uh, designing, creating, and extending our smart contracts on Cardano. He is currently at M Labs, where he is the Haskell and Plutus technical lead. We also have joining us today. Well, thank you, Maximilian, for joining us. Uh, we also have Roberto uh, C. Morano from Gimbal Labs. Uh, he studied IT systems management and computer science and is a certified AWS, Amazon Web Service Solutions architect and a Google Cloud architect. Roberto is passionate about open source software and is an advocate for that. I love that. Thank you, Roberto. Um, Roberto, uh, uh, he also worked as a DevOps advocate at Singular, an IT consulting and IT service company with over a thousand employees globally, where he was responsible for architecting, managing, and supporting the first BAAS, which is business as a service, uh, sorry, banking as a service um, software platform in the United States. Very impressive. He also uh, was lead DevOps advocate at Emergo Global, managing open source projects like the multi-platform cryptocurrency wallet, Yoroi, which was sort of the very first uh, functional usable wallet here on Cardano. So thank you for that. Um, the Blockchain Explorer also uh, Siza, as well as uh, stake pool operations. Uh, Roberto also has been senior systems engineer at Stuart, an online delivery service platform. Uh, he is currently the co-founder of Gimbal Labs and a DevOps advocate at Cardano Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Roberto. And that, last but not least, we have uh, Philip DeSaro. Uh, he's of Vacuum Labs. Philip holds a degree in computer science from UMass Boston, that's University of Massachusetts in Boston. Um, he is also the founder and president of a competitive programming club at um, Boston, at UMass Boston. And he was also um, a member of the NASA Artemis Student Challenge Team, which is very cool for uh, a college project or college student. He worked as an artificial intelligence engineer at Blaze Tech, where he developed a state-of-the-art deep learning model designed to identify and extract event precursors from unstructured text data of the NTSB aviation accident records. So the NTSB, for all you don't know, that is the National Transportation and Safety Board here in the United States. That sounds like some uh, pretty heavy, heavy coding there, which is awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and then Philip has also worked as a software and quality assurance engineer on Sun Density. And that is a company that provides uh, photonic solar conversion products and services. Uh, he was in charge of developing systems to automate the testing and benchmarking of their products. Very cool. 
He's currently at Vacuum Labs where he is taxed with smart contract development, auditing, using a variety of specialized Haskell EDSLs like Plutarch, Pluta, Plutus, along with extensive uh, work with the Cardano Transaction Lib, uh, Plutus Application Backend, and Lucid. So welcome to all of our guests. Thank you all for joining us. I know you're all very busy, uh, have a lot to do, and we're really, really delighted to have you here uh, to share your insights around blockchain security and hack-proofing dApps on Cardano. Yes, so a warm welcome to be moderated by Mr. Bharat Malapur, CTO, Dean of uh, Emergo Academy. Uh, over to you, Bharat, along with the uh, speakers on the panel. Have a great time. Yeah, so, all right, Bharat, so before we go in, so I'll just uh, spotlight the panelists along with Bharat and Jonah. So remaining people would move to the backstage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kapil. Bharat, you could go ahead. Yeah, okay. So thanks, thanks uh, Kapil, Jona for walking us through this introduction. Um, now starts the real fun, right? So <laughs> this is what you have been really waiting for, right? So uh, first of all, you know, uh, we, we have had a very wonderful um, response from the attendees. Uh, we had asked all of them to probably ask one question that they felt uh, needed to be answered about blockchain security and uh, you know the best practices for DAP uh, hack proofing. Right? So right off the bat, let's start with the first one. Um, how are DAO tools being highlighted in security? Are they are the appropriate security principles being standardized in these principles in these tools? So Curtis Myers, one of our learners, is asking this: How are DAO tools being highlighted in security? So who would like to? Uh, probably we can we can have. Uh, each one of you share your thoughts on this. I'd like to say a few words on this, but perhaps Philip would like to, given that currently Vacuum Labs is auditing Agora. So that would be something uh, very much related to perhaps what Philip is doing currently. Among all the things that he does. <laughs> I am actually not on, on that project specifically. Uh, I did reach out to them today to talk about it, but yeah, I've been heavily invested in Agora from the start, and I was gonna say uh, you should take it because you know <laughs> you guys are from M Labs. So. <laughs> okay, okay, playing ball. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, I can take it. I can take it. So, uh, for for a little bit of a co of context as to how DAO tooling on Cardano has evolved uh, thus far. So, from the very beginning, uh, Cardano had a vision to indeed end uh, of all things with Voltaire uh, and be very much mindful and focused on uh, responsible governance. And uh, it has fostered a community of like-minded individuals, um, most pronounced at, and here I'm going to give a shout out to the ADAO folks who, ha who are currently uh, having uh, alongside Liquid, uh, Agora audited, the thing I just mentioned. Um, and that, that's a, a first proper, fully functioning DAO on-chain governance module where you can have a vote, have the uh, votes tallied in a fully decentralized manner, and the result of that vote actually uh, pass and effect be yielded, uh, to use more technical terms. Um, and that, that, that's a step in the, in the right direction. Uh, the question was, I believe, how, how what are this, the steps how, taken? How are the DAO tools uh, being highlighted in security? So how, maybe the question could be more like, how, how do DAO tools sort of help bring in an element of security maybe through decentralization, et cetera? So. Yes, the initiative is very important because it is fully open. So um, initially, uh, so, so this is this is a very very not, not not well known fact, but Sunday Swap has launched with their own governance system, and and it is fully closed source. So uh, comparing that to a system that's currently fully open source, Agora, I believe open source is the right way for uh, DAO tools. And I just want to jump on and add to that. As far as I know about the Sunday Swap solution, 
it is uh, an, uh, a lot of the work is relegated off chain, uh, whereas Agora is a fully on chain solution. And that, that's a huge difference because there's no element of trust uh, in a fully on chain solution. Whereas, I'm not 100% certain on that. We, we have been working on yeah. that. We made it. And there's like a bit of history for that, but whatever. Yeah, it, <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, well, it's, it, it's was... more, more decentralized than, uh, more on-chain than, uh, than off-chain probably. Some, uh, some key elements would be definitely on-chain, right? Yeah, I yeah, thought there was uh, some snapshotting component. Yeah, Could right. Be, yeah, yesterday, no they, they released uh, a video, I mean, Pi from Sandy Swap uh, went into the Nerd Out uh, show with Andrew Westberg, and they told a bit about how it works. And it's based on Merkle Merkle trees. Um, they they basically post uh, the the proof on chain, and anybody that can that has uh, the they vote, let's say, uh, can can check that the result is is fine. So it's a uh, it's off chain. It doesn't rely on smart contracts, but the, it's cryptographically uh, provable, and it's uh, it can be considered uh, tamper proof and safe. Um, which is, you know, if if you ask uh, what's what's being done in the DAO ecosystem to to provide security, well, we are innovating and we are coming with all these uh, new approaches to to reach. Uh, Consensus about things or or bold uh, and fine agreements. Um, yeah, it's a very novel scenario that not only involves software <laughs> software uh, security but also social uh, attack vectors. And um, you know, it's uh, that there is another uh, um, tool or tooling that it's being built by Botter, uh, which is basically based on. It is based in a similar way, uh, like uh, Catalyst does. Uh, you you post polls on chain, and then you, as Ada holder, you vote. You can you can participate through their front end, or you can uh, decide to to build the metadata yourself and post the metadata on chain, and then you do the tallying based on the blockchain story. And you know that's probably one way to to make it uh, as uh, well as on chain as a smart contract solution um, but in a way that it's um, yeah also secure so there there are many different approaches and we are trying to find those uh, security insights as we go i would say so I, I had a question here. Um, if you look at the, the project catalyst and this liquid democracy uh, kind of a concept where uh, there's a committee which uh, sort of encrypts the ballot, right? And then the ballot sort of um, stays encrypted till the end of voting. And then, you know, the committee sort of recreates the key to decrypt it and look at the, uh, look at the result, right? But um, at that point, when the decryption happens, um, how is the the secrecy or the you know the the privacy of voting going to be maintained? So would that be within with something like Merkle trees? Um, any any thoughts on how this could be done? Because ultimately the in, encryption can sort of help you uh, protect the data as long as the voting is going on. But let's say for example you know you have uh, people who might say you know let's say my boss says you know um, I want you to delegate your vote to me. I, I always ask this, I always state this in the classes, right? Um, suppose that happens, right? I could delegate my vote to my boss and then I can vote separately and my vote would count over my delegated vote. So how do you sort of make sure that there is privacy in this kind of stuff? Because uh, this would be a great way to sort of um, foolproof the, the, you know, the voting system where uh, you've got so many issues with uh, votes being bought or social pressure being applied or something like that. So how do you bring that in into DAOs? That's a hard question. It's a real hard question. And I don't think there's an easy answer to this. Fundamentally, it ties into the nature of the blockchain, the ledger being fully open and transparent. Each address, each pub key uh, being fully able to be inspected 
uh, even rudimentary chain analysis can lead to the whole structure of even if you're using multiple uh, public keys to store all your portfolio, all your assets can be found. Um, it comes down to where the fees are coming from. What there's, there's an entire structure that needs to happen before even we can begin to think about making voting uh, anonymous. Um, I would personally say that there is most probability of success and most uh, sound solutions in the zero knowledge space around this. We have discussed internally uh, a few possible solutions here to make even whole systems uh, before even Agora was a thing uh, around ZK proofs, but uh, un unfortunately Cardano doesn't have yet a uh, primitive to help us uh, support this uh, notion. And it would have to be added as a primitive uh, for for it to be efficient. But awesome. that will come, come around soon. Uh, people at Orbis are making great strides in, in, at ensuring that this will be a thing in the future. That's great. Uh, Philip or Roberto, any any thoughts to add uh, on this? Yeah, I just want to jump on the next question in relation to this. So the next mm -hmm. question is, how can we prevent a developer for taking all the funding money from themselves? It happened before, how to prevent it? Uh, yeah. And this relates to this in the sense that you can put the funding money in a treasury uh, and then use a tool like Agora or a DAO tool uh, to assure that the money can only be spent if uh, some voting threshold is met. Okay. So then one developer couldn't just roguely run away with all the money. So initially you're saying that it would start off as a sort of like a something that is driven by developers, but then as the DAO sort of becomes more active, more people start participating then it becomes well, I'm saying easy if you want your community to trust you as a developer with your funding, right? So you get funding from the community from like an ICO, mm -hmm. you can spin up a DAO using whatever governance architecture you want. Mm -hmm. uh, and then lock the funding in a smart contract that can only be spent from uh, if a certain vote threshold is met in that governance uh, module. So this assures that the developer can't just spend all the money by himself without getting the consensus of the community slash token holders. True. I, I guess this was the original principle behind the DAO. And um, you know, the first implementation, of course, was quite, uh, you know, uh, it had this bug where it caused almost $50 million worth of ether to get drained. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we have learned from all those mistakes that have happened in various blockchain uh, protocols and applications. And I guess today we are in a in a different uh, zone, especially with so many um, so many security guarantees or security um, sort of um, approaches that are currently available on Cardano. Um, yeah. So um, I would like to add a, a couple yeah, no, of no. thoughts around around general security here because. Uh, most of the time we are thinking about the smart contract security, but there is a, you know, there are more, um, there is a huge attack surface to uh, companies uh, when we are talking about funds. And, you know, I will, I will advise anybody that funding a, a, an organization wanting to deal with uh, DAO treasuries, wallets and keys uh, to include a security expert as soon as possible, you know, in the whole process, because you, you know, we as developer know all the uh, neat and grits of these systems that uh, you know usually the the people and in smart contract funds can be suffer but um, what about the wallets of the stakeholders of the company how how you how, how you manage that it's uh, very important in my humble opinion and also adding about another thought about uh, losses um, you know and this could be like a whole debate or a whole new roundtable. It's uh, it's not only about um, 
uh, funds being stolen from a smart contract or a wallet, but also about downtime. We are building a decentralized um, world where downtime, I mean, having a platform uh, down for five minutes could be uh, could incurring losses of millions. So we need to take into account all those design decisions uh, from the very beginning and include experts um, in the design of these solutions from the very beginning. So we, we don't incur in the, you know, maybe, I don't know, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is if, if you have a DEX, but you only have one front end for that DEX, and if the front end is hosted in AWS and AWS decide to shut it down, well, you have a non so decentralized exchange that might be losing <laughs> a lot of money. So yeah, I, I, I think that's part of the security of the apps. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's rarely uh, debated. So I wanted to, yeah. May, may I ask a little follow-up to uh, what Philip mentioned about the DAO um, and treasury aspect? I, I always wondered if if you set up, I mean, I believe that is a very, very uh, uh, good way to do it is to have like the multi-sig uh, treasury um, in a DAO. But I had a question. I mean, if someone was to lose, let's say you needed three out of five keys to, you know, to move funds out of the DAO, what happens if you have like one of the members as acting maliciously and doesn't want to release funds or loses those keys. How do you deal? Are those funds locked forever at that point? Or is there some sort of backdoor that the developer <laughs> would put in to uh, mitigate that sort of issue? Every backdoor you implement is a backdoor that's going to be exploited. Yeah. In a yeah. case <laughs> of a true three out of five, if suddenly three keys go AWOL, it's gone. That's the point. It's gone. Um, it's a pro and a con, and certainly there's a risk profile associated, and for larger amounts of funds, sufficiently large amount of keys of separate uh, people would be advised, but, uh, you know, if there's no backdoors, which... <laughs> Know, if there's backdoors to a multi-sig, there's a little point, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, point was made. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I want to share an idea that Adriana from Game Changer Wallet uh, came up with the the other day. That it's uh, we we can build multi-sig uh, scripts, native native scripts, and we can implement uh, them as well in in smart contracts for sure. <laughs> But uh, where you can have, say, an organization which requires two scripts, uh, I mean, one of two scripts to, to sign a transaction, to release funds, to move funds. One of the scripts could be a multi-sig that um, includes uh, three, uh, two or three founders, for example. But the other one could be uh, 80 uh, keys. Um, and, you know, you could have like, the the organization members who decide to sign all together and pass the the one of the two um, requirements uh, for for the multi sig uh, wallet and that's very very powerful idea when you combine uh, this uh, this or maybe we could even have a time lock where after let's say after two years uh, maybe one of the keys is allowed to uh, take it out right and of course. Right. There would be plenty of time for you to know that, you know, okay, that time lock is about to expire and, you know, <laughs> people have to make sure that, you know, this these funds are moved into another smart contract or something like that. So that could be another way to do it. Yeah, that's actually a common architecture, having a time since last transaction included in the datum. And then uh, essentially if someone doesn't interact with the contract for a certain amount of time. Excellent. I, lo I love those solutions. That was that was fantastic. That's amazing. I had one more question around this because this came up recently in some chats I was having with folks that uh, apparently um, Cardano Foundation gifted their keys to the Treasury to IOG. <laughs> and I was wondering, how do you move keys and still maintain the security that that the person who moved the keys didn't keep a copy? Is that possible? Um, what, what's going on there? Does anybody know? Uh, I, I would like to make a clarification on that because it's not that they uh, 
transferred the keys or copied the keys, uh, they were delegated to, to IOG. So they just removed the delegation to IOG uh, wallets. So they, they now have the power back to, to control these Genesis keys. Okay. But yeah, that's a very good question. Like how, how you handle keys without, uh, without leaking them. I mean, they, are, they, they can be considered compromised already, mm -hmm. right? So right. Okay. you better move the funds and use a different one. And if, <laughs> if, All right. So if we are uh, maybe about... one, one more question, which is coming up. I would like to answer some of the, I would like to get some of the questions which are being asked live to be answered. So off-chain code is maybe the area where we have less of information or you know material available. Is PAB the best way to uh, handle the off-chain aspects or should we really invest on classical web development where there's a big lag of more info? Is this really true? So uh, the official PAB is, is definitely not the way to go right now. Um, and there are a few uh, PAB-like solutions. Uh, there's the MLabs one. There's Q uh, Quadrants, uh, Kuber it's called. And there's a few other Haskell backends. And then there's the PureScript solution, the Cardano transaction lib, and uh, Cardano serialization lib, and Lucid. Um, I wouldn't really consider it classical web dev, though, because if you were to just hire like a React developer or something, it's it's not <laughs> likely that they'd be able to help you. Um, so these are like really information specific skills, uh, especially in the Cardano ecosystem. But I would say um, if you are just starting your yeah. personal project, that is the way to go. Like something like Lucid. Okay, yeah, that, that seems to make sense, right? Because it's so much e easier to get through that rather than struggle with the PAB. And the fact that you know there are so many different PAVs, each trying to solve some spectrum of problems. Right. Thanks for that. Um, next is uh, Curtis asks if I have sensitive or confidential information, is it best practice to not include this in the Pluto script? If so, how should confidential data be handled in a DApp? And maybe a follow up question from me would be, you know, would would decentralized identity help in this and what kind of solutions would, would really solve this problem of uh, personally identifiable information? The only real solution here would be some kind of zero knowledge argument. Hate, hate, to, br hate to bring it up again, but it, it is the only way to really handle truly information that you don't want to reveal, but rather prove that you, for example, have something, uh, but not reveal it. Um, there's, and building on that technology, you can design systems such as the, the centralized identity, medical storage. Um, but again, we lack the capacity currently on Cardano to properly do it. So for the time being, I would simply advise to not include it if you can, and if you must, uh, at least do it behind a hash. <laughs> That's the least you could do. Yeah, because if it's uh, if it's including in the Bluetooth script, it's already public, right? Uh, I mean, well, kinda. Um, so yeah, I would advise to maybe use off-chain storage, encrypted off-chain storage, and include proofs, uh, hashes on chain that refer to those and, you know, handle them privately in the back end. And I don't know, it, it really, truly depends on what's, what's actually uh, the problem we want to solve. But um, yeah, and not to talk about GPDR and that kind of stuff, how we deal with that uh, in this uh, environment, right? How you comply? Would you, would you live that? <laughs> GDP. <laughs> I don't think we do it. <laughs> I think that whenever personally identifiable information comes up, GDPR is probably the one thing which uh, always comes up that right to be forgotten or something like that. But I, I think that's not a major thing to worry about, right? I mean, you just have a hash on the blockchain and then all the PI goes off chain either on a decentralized service like IPFS 
or um, maybe some sort of a, um, a decentralized database uh, like thread or uh, textile threads or something on top of IPFS that can take care of a lot of things, right? Um, so can I just ask Philip? a quick a quick question here? Sorry, Philip, did you have a comment on this? I was just going to briefly mention that yeah, hashing uh, right now for simple things like say you have an ID and you want to store your personal data on an ID, and on the other end you want people to be able to scan that uh, ID as an NFT uh, and see <laughs> if you are actually the person that you claim to be. Uh, you would store the hash on chain. And then the ID would be the actual data. And then the scanner would just hash the data. And if it matches Very the fun. hash on chain, then you know that the data is correct. Cool. So uh, how far are we away from ZK proofs? What's the real timeline? What do you guys think? Not that far, far, far off, actually. Uh, I believe it mostly comes down to size limitations uh, on Cardano because for, uh, I believe, Starks, you don't need an additional primitive. If you wanted to do a, a Snark, you would need to, to add an additional primitive. But if, you, if you're going with Starks, um, then you could do it um, with, I believe, only the primitives that, that are going to be introduced in the next hard fork. In the Chang one, but the bit bit bit, bit ops primitives, <laughs> uh, you can do uh, modular operations eff efficiently enough to for it to make make, make any sort of sense. Um, so you would be only be limited by the size of transaction and uh, it all being included, processed, and then what kind of logic do you do with it? Um, that sort of thing. Uh, I wouldn't say we're far off, but. You know, <laughs> uh, we, we're currently in what? September? Uh, at the yeah. end of September, we're going to go through with the June hard fork. I really like to refer to it as the June hard fork. <laughs> uh, Vassal, that is. Um, <laughs> because it hi highlights that excellency um, and proper um, work uh, that is fully uh, checked by everyone involved takes a long time. So, you know, while we had those prim ops ready uh, in, I think, April, um, it's, it's, it takes a little time to, for it to be included. So give it to that, like half a year, maybe, optimistically speaking, you'd see Excellent. something. Thank you. Thank you for that. Excellent. Go ahead. Uh, you want to find the next question for us, Barack? Yeah. So KN is asking: Some smart contracts are initiated using an authentication NFT, where the NFT is used as a hard-coded value within the contract, so that the contract can validate the authenticity of its state UTXO. Since currency symbols and validator hashes cannot be generated on chain, is there a robust solution to provide guarantees that a smart contract has been initiated with an actual NFT and not a token? that might have been minted with a quantity higher than one. That's a mouthful, but yeah. Yes, uh, unless Philip or Roberto want to take it, but yes, this is this yeah. is a common pattern. You, you raised your hands. This is a common design pattern. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, but this is a common design pattern. Uh, you can actually see it in action. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, this is the script that failed. Well, a, a, a script that follows the same design pattern that failed in the initial mint swap hack, quote unquote. Because what there is a way to do it. Because essentially, essentially, you create the NFT at the token name level, not at the currency symbol level. And then relying on that currency symbol, you know, okay, that currency symbol is an NFT, and by its via its minting policy, you ensure that it is indeed an NFT by doing uh, essentially hashing the UTXO ref of one of the inputs, and there you go, an NFT at a token name level. So that's how it's done. But uh, <laughs> Roberto, Philip, <laughs> any, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if you can check if there is only one of those, uh, you can check it, it, it's, the, it's the policy plus name that you want to check. I don't know if you could ensure that it, there is only one of those. So it's an actual NFT. Right. Yeah, for, oh yeah, sorry, you. Yeah. 
sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. just okay. wanted to yeah, throw yeah. The, the question to you, actually. In, in general, <laughs> I don't think it's possible if you just want to say, is this arbitrary currency symbol that I know nothing about uh, in NFT? Then the answer is no. But uh, it is possible if you have more information than that. Well, I think you're mute, Bharat, or at least I can hear you. Yeah, maybe could you expand upon that, Philip? Uh, so I can't even, I can't really consider a use case. Say, I guess you have like an NFT marketplace and maybe you want to ensure that people are only selling NFTs on it uh, and not things that are minted multiple times. That Without knowing about the currency symbol, there's really no way to do that. But mm -hmm. I don't think you would really want to do this in general. So like um, if, if you know the currency symbol, then you know the minting policy and you can guarantee that it's an nft based on things like if it's a you know the tx out ref example in the Plutus pioneer program which is a common way to to make a one shot so you need more information than just having some random uh, token to be able to check if it's an nft this is a hack, but you, and I'm going to say the ZK proof word again, but if we see an extension to Cardano, it would be possible to create a zero knowledge proof that a script, a certain script is indeed an NFT via its inspection of the um, native script, for example, technically possible in the future. But again, like the others said, there's not really a point. There's an easier way to do it programmatically via the example I mentioned earlier. So uh, one of the next questions is, SSI with multi-party competition solves two of the problems that you're talking, speaking about. There's self-sovereign identity with a multi-party competition. Uh, well, it's more of a comment, I guess. Multi-party multi -party competition is far from perfect. So, any any comments on that? I guess. Okay. So, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, since, yeah. since nobody's saying anything, what 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 is meant by uh, SSI with multi-party competition? Um, First time I'm so, hearing about that. Yeah, self-sovereign identity, I could understand that part, but uh, with a multi-party competition, uh, I'm not sure. Because uh, typically, uh, maybe this might be something, maybe he can just um, elaborate upon that question and ask it in a more, de uh, right, slightly more detail. That would help. Well, perhaps we could bring him on stage. You could ask yeah, him in chat, not? elaborate a little. So Francisco, one second, let's just see. One second, Ali. Yeah, Francisco, um, I you can unmute and ask the question. Yeah, thank you. No, remember before earlier we were speaking about what happens if the private keys are compromised. So yeah, in a part, oh. multi-party competition can solve that. That that's that was my comment, and then mm -hmm. SSI solves identifying. So yeah, yeah there are, okay. So yeah, I mean uh, maybe I can at least answer some part of this. So typically, if you have a SSI solution where you you have sort of uh, published some sort of <coughs> did on the chain, uh, which sort of holds some document which has your public key, um, and suppose your private key gets compromised, right? So typically there are ways where you can, when you're, uh, when you're building the DID document or maybe even later, uh, when you still have control of the private key, you can sort of have some sort of a, a transition where you can specify in the DID document that in case this, uh, this key gets compromised, then, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to sort of, um, you know, update this document, DID document with a secondary uh, key. So you can you can do that. You can have that specified in the in the onset onset itself, so that you have some sort of disaster management. That can be done. So is is does that answer your question, Francisco? 
It makes total sense. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so then, yeah. Okay, so um, Cristobal Morgado asks, uh, Lucid depends on block frost, and since this is not a freely available REST API, doesn't that uh, sort of bring in uh, a centralization into the entire uh, off-chain off code? Yeah, hopefully it's open soon because there is a catalyst proposal to do so. So we won't have to worry about that uh, in the near future. Um, but yeah, there are some other, I mean, for example, you could use Ocmios to calculate fees for a smart contract execution. There are yeah, some other alternatives. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm building down the line, which is what, what I am to, to build is a decentralized or distributed decentralized uh, alternative to, to the API oh. layer of Cardano, because yeah, I think it's uh, pretty important, not only that block for us is open source, but that we, we deploy an, infra an infrastructure layer to access the blockchain that is decentralized enough. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, we have infusion. And more performance, we... I mean, not just decentralized, but also because it's distributed and decentralized, it's also more performant. Yep. Yeah, I heard about Dandelion like a few days ago also. It's awesome. I'm a fan <laughs> of the initiative. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. but, but just, just, a just, to, of... just a quick note here on, on Lucid. You can, you don't have to use Block Trust. It's just their like easy way to do things. And it's great for prototyping. Um, that's kind of the headspace you get into while, while doing Lucid. It's meant to be easy, simple, straightforward. And... Um, once you have that done, once you have an initial prototype, you can just simply take out all the block, block first calls out and get all the data you need yourself and only use the code for processing transactions. Right. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to Mesh, uh, I mean, to Martify Labs who are building Mesh, which is uh, using Koyos as one of the backends to get blockchain protocol parameters and blockchain data in general. Um, um, in this particular context, uh, you know, uh, Philip and I were just talking about uh, Kupo, right? And Kupo, uh, does, right. does that make sense in this particular yes. context? Uh, I don't think you can access all you need with Kupo. Kupo is more like, let's say, events-oriented API. That, yeah, Ahmed could, could do that job. Also, you um, have Aura and Scrolls uh, from TX5. Kupo is really nice to use, but yeah, you sometimes need full Ogmius capability. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> good. He also asked so, this question that was put in answer that says, if we use web libs such as Lucid, then we have to have classical code hosted somewhere. And then we have to have on-chain validator available to be sent to the transaction. This is where usual web security is needed. No more decentralized services. And to, to briefly answer this, um, it it shouldn't matter. You shouldn't need any security uh, in the in the transaction building side That's of right. things. Since you'll never be able to to guarantee transactions are built some way. You could build your Absolutely. whole front end in Lucid or whatever you want, and then someone use Cardano Cly and write their own transaction and send it to your smart contract uh, in a way. Actually, you actually, you could be afraid of your front end being served from a source that can be tainted. Um, so if you want to avoid that, you could decide to host your front end on IPFS so you have the content hash that will always match the front end you deployed and it's probably that it's it's uh, yeah, 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 yeah it's, that's that's true. But of course, IPFS is more uh, more good for uh, static resources, not for some of the dynamic serving of content. So yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I really am waiting for somebody to come up with. Uh, 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 I mean, I have heard of some, but something where um, you know, the entire dynamic server components are on a decentralized service that would be awesome. So maybe somebody there was yeah. an architecture like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like with IPFS, the main site with the links to others, other components that link to other so, components. It's, I've seen something like that once. Yeah, textile, I think yes. textile and unstoppable domains and stuff like that, I think yeah. does approach some of it. But yeah. In general, though, I think you want your smart contracts to be secure. And if they're secure, Absolutely. then however you interact with them shouldn't matter. Yeah, because there's no guarantee, right? I mean, we might, as you said, right? We might secure our front end code and then somebody, you know, there's, there's always this decentralization where somebody can just post a transaction to the on-chain code and that's the main test of it. Of course, what most importance must be placed on the smart contracts themselves on chain um, to be safe and secure. However, on Cardano, even more so than Ethereum, I would personally say uh, the first transaction being created uh, from the front end is incredibly dangerous so to say mm -hmm. there's a lot of, of room to just mess things up even if we, if we may may try and include things in the on-chain side they may simply be ignored so um there is a great deal of importance here placed must be placed on ensuring that no matter what data on the front end is input and the transaction will be uh valid in, in a sense yeah. that no no um, no user no, funds will be lost. Yeah, well, I was thinking uh, in in the, uh, about the scenario where you know a malicious front end could trigger on a smart contract, but also include some extra UTXO, some you know uh, leak some funds. That's something that probably. Regular users that land in a web page and interact with the platform um, won't really take the time to explore all the UTXOs that are mm. embedding the transaction and have the capacity to evaluate if they are right or wrong because they, most of the time they are complex. So even for developers, it will need take time to 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 be audited. So yeah. Yeah, and, and it, the data input uh, is crucial. Uh, in our application, uh, currently we're dealing with uh, what it means to, for, for a certain UTXO, to be, belong to a protocol. Is it just, uh, is it all UTXOs of certain uh, script validator hashes that uh, with some input may validate not necessarily, no. Well, maybe p only part of those. Well, maybe something in between. And uh, this idea it has not yet fully been formed, but th in the future, there will be a lot of discussion around uh, what it means for uh, a certain type of UTXO to constitute a protocol. Um, and, and in fact, this is a, a similar um, uh, headspace was naturally actually developed in the uh, Cardano specification language when you're where you're talking essentially about uh, families of transactions families of transactions uh, f where where you're sim where you're assuming certain types of UTXOs are coming in and you simply filter them out and which script they belong to is only one parameter and that, that, that's kind of a far-fetched thought here can I ask a more uh, yes. general question to all of you? Um, you mentioned uh, Maxi uh, Ethereum, and I, I know the uh, you know there's a, a huge difference between smart contracts developed on Ethereum with the EVM um, um, and the sort of shared ledger state that they use on Ethereum versus sort of the immutable data types that we have with the UTXO model. And my question uh, generally is. As a user, so as someone who's interacting with dApps, um, are there vectors that we should be aware of, um, that we should be careful of? Like uh, one of the things that I know probably doesn't affect us, but something that has been uh, quite rampant on the Ethereum blockchain is malicious NFTs being dropped into people's wallets. Uh, then you interact with the NFT and somehow they drain uh, your funds out. Um, is there anything like that that we should be worried about uh, on the UTXO model or on Cardano as a user? 
well, <laughs> yeah, that, that's also my favorite example of how Ethereum uh, can be bizarrely dangerous to use. Like the, even the idea of just dropping an image into someone's wallet, then and then anyone just making a transaction with that NFT just instantly being drained of all funds is kind of uh, ridiculous to me. But uh, it is uh, true, and people have lost uh, a lot of money to this because they can't get rid of it, essentially. Um, so to the extent of that on Cardano, I wouldn't say so, no. Because you can clearly see the inputs and outputs of your transactions before you even sign them. So. Yeah, excellent. It, uh, I, I open up to Roberto or uh, Philip. Do you guys have any uh, thoughts on this? Maybe just a general, uh, something that we should, as a user might need to be aware of. I know this NFT case, uh, as uh, Maxi mentioned, is not something that we need to worry about, but is there another blind spot for users on Cardano? Uh, I will say there is a, <laughs> there, there is an scenario that happened before that I got asked by some, some buddies. Uh, and, you know, your wallet could be a, a spam and you could be, you could be receiving like thousands of uh, asset, different assets, and that makes your uh, UTXO distribution in the wallet uh, very weird, very fragmented. And then wallets had, uh, may have problem handling those. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one of the guys that asked me uh, had the problem with Yoroi, where you know he had uh, like I think it was 500 uh, different. Uh, assets there and he couldn't get um, his stake out of that wallet because it will fail. Uh, I don't know if the case was that the backend had traveled to you know compute uh, all the the whole list of UTXOs for that specific wallet if it was the front end and the JavaScript leaking memory wherever but that's <laughs> that's something that uh, could happen and it's the only you know at the <laughs> protocol level we are we are safe, for sure. Um, other than that, I cannot think of, of any other thing. Yes, well, I have contract. suffered from. Sorry, I just want to make. I have suffered from UTXO fragmentation a few times, so I, <laughs> I, I, I know that pain. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Philip. <laughs> yeah, smart smart contracts are not actors in Cardano, so they can't just do things on on their own. But for things you have to watch out for from a user perspective, mostly it's uh, in the front end, like, uh, so you want to send your friend uh, some, some money, some ADA. A common exploit is some sort of uh, key logger or virus that will replace uh, your control C, control V with a different address. So these are things you have to look out for, double check, you know, double checking addresses and and looking at the input and, and outputs. Definitely having a hardware wallet. Yes. That's encouraging. I mean, that that's great. I I love the fact that we have sort of a, a, a more secure, at least it feels that way, uh, blockchain ecosystem to to work within. So that's great. Thank you, guys. Yeah. One so quick note I, here yeah. about the distinction of as to how much better than Ethereum we currently are uh, is. Very commonly, you want to just sign something, a message, to prove that you are this actor without actually making a transaction and incurring penalties, uh, you know, going through the latency problem. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, uh, on Ethereum, if you sign a transaction, air arbitrary data, later on, that data may be used to, uh, to invoke a transaction. Currently, uh, on Cardano, that would be uh, much harder to accomplish, and some would even claim impossible, uh, borderline impossible, thanks to CIP8, the transaction signing um, metadata standard. Right, which by the way, hardware wallets doesn't support just yet because <laughs> there are <laughs> some limitations to, to overcome. Right. Okay, great. So um, I think, uh, you know, here I'd like to take a pause from questions right, and talk more about, um, you know, what is, what, is, what have your experiences been 
on you know what what are the really important things to take care of when you are trying to um, hack proof your dapps right so what are the various security measures that you come to understand you know these are very important for for getting uh, your dapp secure so probably if, um, i'll start off with maximilian again well i suppose my my experience with this has has been you know getting audited by twig not so not so long ago on optim and um what what sort of measures have we taken to um prevent hacks well first and foremost i would highly advise nay i would say it's a requirement to specify uh what transactions what sort of logic uh, your protocol uh, must um must implement before even touching any code before before doing any programming write it out concisely Specs. unambiguously specify it yes um the, this 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 line of thinking get got us to creating the cardano specification language which i'm told is nearly production ready <laughs> it's been in that state for for a few long weeks now but i think it's about ready now if not ready only to check up on them but uh, even even without touching any uh, any tools that you know later on will help you ensure that this is indeed what you wanted uh help you in an automatic way to process that specification um you should just write it in a markdown document at the very least here's the transaction 1 that's how it works transaction 2 okay you have a transaction line okay another scenario another scenario example data okay you have that in your mind perfect then translate that into specific concrete validators okay this one does that 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 and once you have that full picture and this abstract and clear way of representing validators you can with more certainty argue about their correctness and i would i would personally say that without it there is no point in even having your script be audited because yeah. what is what is even meant to be the correct behavior if not something you've specified prior to implementing it Uh, that's my behavior here Maximilian, uh, i would like just like to ask uh, before we get down to the transaction uh, you know transaction 1 uh, this is how it going to go uh, this is the structure etc uh, would it make more sense to look at it from a use case perspective where we really look at identifying the participants understanding what are the what are the activities that they can do and then you know try to look at malicious behavior there what kind of malicious behavior could come in here um so yes that, be... that that is something that needs to take prior to to this <laughs> um obviously if you don't have the full use case in your mind then it's going to be a back and forth process and it usually is our product has gone through many iterations over the course of its lifetime and it unfortunately doesn't help to improve the uh, security however um it is something that innovation necessitates as you develop it further you realize oh you need this and that feature but this transaction is too restrictive you need mm -hmm. to take a step back improve it um so and, and here a quick note that while while it is worthwhile to think about any sort of uh, economic type of attacks mm -hmm. it is very hard to even uh, argue about them so try as you may but um somebody eventually even if it if if it is something that can only happen on a scale of having millions of dollars will do it so hmm. yeah i'm a big fan of behavior driven development which it takes this approach of going outside in and you know have a common language between all the stakeholders business requirements and developers i mean bis the business logic is uh defining the same language than the developer you will use to write test to pass against those statements um yeah uh, i i don't know that much or almost anything about haskell but heard about property based uh testing on on haskell and would love if if uh philip or matthew maxi can expand on that 
So that, yeah, uh, I think that's the first step, defining how the whole platform or the whole D app and not only the smart contract should behave. Um, and I, I, I will add, if you can have some test uh, environment where you maybe spin up your own private test net and generate traffic there and try to simulate some attacks, and play the role of uh, the cow's monkey and try to cause trouble in, in a controlled environment that it's almost free, that will be another good, uh, another good measure. Uh, Philip, uh, your thoughts on um, what are the what are the various experiences that have led you to say, okay, if I look at security, these are the top maybe three uh, things that we should be looking at. So uh, we have the benefit of being in the Haskell slash functional programming ecosystem. So we get a lot of nice things that uh, Solidity and other blockchains don't blockchain languages don't have mm -hmm. um, and our actual property based testing systems are probably better than any other programming language um, we there's even specific ones uh, there's apropos tx uh, specific to transact uh, to the cardano ecosystem but even more general ones like hedgehog uh, are great um, formal specification from a descriptive level uh, or a graphical level. Another common way of doing it is modeling contracts as uh, finite state machines and then drawing them out, um, which is really prevalent in the Ethereum ecosystem um, because the very limited ways they have of proving certain properties about it about contracts written in Solidity involve that type of architecture and design uh, using things like Solidity SMT checker and, and whatnot. Uh, but beyond written specification with like LaTeX, you can also have programmatic specification where uh, if you look in like the Agora libraries or something, you'll see Agora specs, which sort of define how things are supposed to work from a technical level. Uh, and then even beyond property-based testing, the next step, so you have unit tests, property-based tests, and then you have even formal verification with tools like Agda, Isabel, or Koch. And um, for even right now, I think IOHK has a repo where Plutus is uh, entirely specified in Agda, which uh, writes proofs of the correctness of Plutus and the Plutus core that it generates. So these are things you can look into from a developer perspective. OK. So um, other than you know, having specs and uh, you know, having formal verification, what are the, uh, I mean, you, you talked about quite a few things. You talked about property-based testing, you talked about unit testing, you talked about uh, even, for example, um, you know, state modeling, and then uh, only the desirable states are sort of um, factored in. And But how, how, how does that happen? I mean, uh, when you say that formal verification with uh, Isabel or Agda or this, so exactly what what is the, what is the approach being done there? How, how do you sort of bring in that, um, guarantee with a programming language. So you, uh, there's a common misconception that Agda or any other proof assistant will just prove the correctness in general of something. And it, it won't just, you can't just say, here's a smart contract, tell me that this works correctly and use Agda to prove that. It, you need to prove it to some specification. Uh, and if your specification is incorrect, even though it's proving that your model meets that specification, that doesn't necessarily mean that the contract itself is correct. In fact, it means it's incorrect because the specification uh, is incorrect. So again, the most important thing is having a specification that is correct and, and very and detailed. Rigorous. Yes. So you mean and to say that absence there, of proof is not proof of absence? Yes. 
And then from there, you can build everything else to prove that specification. So you write your specification, and then all these things, unit testing, property-based testing, and proof assistance are all used to prove that that specification is implemented correctly. Okay, Excellent, thank you guys. Maybe we could uh, bring some of our attendees up to ask a question. Um, we have uh, just four right now uh, in the Q&A section, but if uh, Eduardo, you wanted to come up or Juan, and then um, we did have a pretty technical question from Samir Gupta, but I'm not sure if he's still with us to ask it. Um, but if any of you uh, attendees in the audience would love uh, to come up and ask a question live, uh, please raise your hand and uh, let us know. And you can uh, also ask the question dead if you prefer. That's exactly right. You could do that. <laughs> we, I think maybe Samir's text will will call will count as. Oh, great, excellent. Eduardo's coming up, and uh, Kapil, could you pin him uh, to the board so we can see his face? That'd be great. Sure. All right, Eduardo, you are ready to go. Yeah. Hey, hey, everyone. Th thanks for your time today. So I had a quick question. Hey, one second, um, Jonah. I think uh, can we make Eduardo panelist and can we see him while he's talking? Wait, one second. Wait, um, I'll promote him to a panelist. I promoted him. Yeah. He's just joining. Okay. Him. Okay. Fine. Eduardo, just just start the video, please. I just uh, add you uh, for this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hey. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate your time today. So I had a, I had a question from a developer kind of ecosystem standpoint, right? So something Ethereum has is something like Morales, if you guys are familiar with that, right? So sort of smart contract templates, right? That really, really help developers trying to, uh, trying to come up with, you know, their own D apps, right? Um, is, there, is there any work being done, you know, to that nature in, in, uh, in uh, Cardano that you guys are familiar with? Maybe mm, I would say I something like Marlow. Marlow could be something where, for example, you've got the uh, um, Actus FRF, right? So right. Actus yeah. is sort of a standard for uh, financial contracts. And there's, there's a classification of around 23 or 24 different contract types, uh, which sort of model all financial contracts that have ever existed. Right? So in a way, you can say that um, you know, the Actus standard along with Marlow could be um, something really, um, you know, revolutionary there. Right. Yeah. And I, I did participate in the Marlow Pioneers program, and but that's limited to financial uh, financial. financial contracts, right? And Marlow being a, a DSL, right? Meaning mm -hmm. that you can't write anything that's sort of outside of it. So yes, in that sense. Um, but I, I was speaking more broadly, right? I know there's some uh, like DAO templates, right, that are coming out and I want to be maybe non-technical with the word template, right? But yeah, I don't know if, if that's something that, uh, you know, we're, we're making efforts or, you know, anyone that the panelists are familiar with. Any yeah, so uh, I, I can speak to that now that you've rephrased this question. So uh, when it comes to templating, I think the practice came through, through from the world of solidity, um, but, but some, uh, some meaning a vocal majority uh, of, of people who are critis criticizing it say that um, it, it is an incredibly b bad to use templates uh, for products because it, it leads to people not fully understanding them, making assumptions, uh, and Templating projects in general is bad. Well, well, you can, of course, fork a project, understand it, but setting a precedent for templating projects, in my humble opinion, is bad. And most forks, as we've seen on Ethereum, uh, fail. Most forks. So, uh, of, of projects. Uh, for example, we've seen many maker forks, we've seen many OM forks, um, all, all of them eventually fail. Is is has been the pattern really? Um, and while of course the the open source projects, you should just you know look look into and learn from them. I, I, I personally am against just copying them. Just on, on like yeah. the principle of of it leading towards you making a mistake. 
So for example, uh, as a follow-up for that, Maximilian, I would say, um, so how do you, uh, where do you draw the line between, let's say, I mean, obviously templating seems to be a little more like a cookie cutter kind of an approach where you are just trying to, uh, you know, like uh, script kiddies, you are trying to use scripts which have been developed by somebody else and, you know, sort of ride on top of that. But um, for example, even if you look at some of the frameworks uh, which are really vast by themselves, right? So how do you sort of get to the point where you where you really know that for for example you take a big uh, DAO framework right and you're integrating it. So how do you how do you sort of ensure that you really understand the nitty gritties of um, all the things that could sort of go wrong in an integration? So well, the problem really is if you try and modify it. That's the problem. If you just use it, it should work as long as mm -hmm. you read about it sufficiently, but yeah. modifying it. Yeah, and as uh, long as you trust the entity that open source the contract and you are able to audit it itself uh, because it could include a backdoor and you, I mean, absolutely. back to why it's a bad idea to, to use templates, it's the same. Uh, yeah. so uh, I share in the chat the, the only uh, registry off-chain registry I know about uh, smart contracts on Cardano. Um, it's been uh, curated by Cardano fans state pool. Um, you you can find there some open source uh, open source smart contracts like JPEG store. But other than that, I know I, I'm not aware of any other like index for smart contracts. So the JPEG contract is a really yeah. good case study, by the way. Should read it. If you Philip, you're saying look something. at the forks of the Plutus use cases repository, um, there's a huge amount of open source Plutus content out there. Uh, and the benefit of the uh, Cardano, one of the biggest benefits of the Cardano ecosystem is that as it stands right now, it's impossible to really be a 14 year old kid, copy paste some code from a repository and start running, you know, blah, blah, swap.com uh, and then just lose everyone a ton of money. Um, the, and people commonly say that we want to make the barrier to entry lower. And we do have things like that, like Merlot, which is to try to make it easier for developers to get started and developing. And that's a good thing, but, uh, we do not want to make it easy to just copy and paste code and, and get something running. That wouldn't be good for the ecosystem. Yeah, and especially had, when there's millions or hundreds of millions of dollars at stake. Yeah. I had a question uh, around this. I mean, Open Zeppelin is a really good service that uh, Ethereum has uh, as far as this, you know, in line with what we're talking about here. I mean, it does have some templated um, smart contract codes, but they're also now on top of that providing um, security services or auditing services. Like if you join, you know, um, Open Zeppelin's like full platform, they will actually now audit what you have written to sort of because they they understand that there's this copy and paste security issue. Um, is it possible, you know, that in the future we might have something that is very robust uh, that does have security auditing built in? I mean, I remember hearing some rumors that uh, either IOG or Cardano Foundation was going to put some sort of like a, a DAP store together. Is this, uh, you know, what do you guys think about those options? It's still in the pipeline. And, and again, because we're in the functional ecosystem, one of the cool things is that a lot of things can be verified uh, programmatically. So one of the cool things about that store was that each app in the store was gonna get a rating, a security rating, and certain levels of that rating would only be able to be achieved with human auditing. Like you would apply for an audit and then you'd get you know, a level two security or whatever. But uh, the first level would be uh, programmatic auditing and you could just apply for, anyone could just apply for that and get it as long as it passes some programmatic checks. Uh, which is really great. And I, I haven't seen another blockchain implement something like that. So it, it is in the exciting. pipeline. That's very exciting. Cool. I would say that personally, I, I'm a little pessimistic 
about the, the idea, just a little. Um, but if any ecosystem can achieve something to this extent, it would be on Cardano, given what uh, my fellow uh, speakers have said about it being fully functional, deterministic, and pure. Otherwise, it makes it nigh impossible without those. I know they haven't launched them yet, but I know Summon is doing sort of the, the DAO platform tooling plug and play sort of idea. I haven't actually seen anything uh, yet, but uh, that's kind of what I understand. Is is that your guys' understanding as well about Summon? Do you guys, are you familiar with that, that project? I am familiar with it personally. And I don't believe that's 100% the idea, although it may feel like it. I think that the idea is to have a platform uh, that allows you to do no code DAOs, first and foremost, um, while also uh, the DAO tooling be provided through the ADAO side. We will see how, how it evolves over time, but that's the basic gist of it, the platform for DAOs right. with all everything included kind of deal. Right, excellent, thank you. Do we have any other attendees who would like to uh, post a question? Uh, uh, Bharat, do you understand Samir Gupta's question? It's very technical. Uh, maybe you could read uh, it. Well, yeah, there is. Uh, there's a lot going on there. So LLVM is uh, something which helps you build uh, the compiler tool chain. And given that LLVM not equal to virtual machine, at least in the strict sense, how do you view the role of virtualization in case semantics, safety of program types? and security of system, how helpful can a soft core CPU be? Uh, we have had some of those soft core CPUs, right? Like for example, we had very long ago, we had something called, uh, I think Crusoe, right? Which was supposed to be, uh, you know, something where you could program the instructions of the CPU itself in, in, a, in a way. Um, so I, I don't know. So say with an FPG, right? To exfiltrate data, simulate custom instructions. So I mean, probably more like a, uh, yeah, a programmable CPU, right? So, um, so how does that uh, programmable CPUs um, help in, let's say, for example, um, formal verification and this entire tool chain uh, of LLVM being used to generate the the tools? Uh, I don't know. It is it is a very technical question. Probably <laughs> uh, somebody who's more familiar with the exact things of formal verification could answer. I uh, sorry, I can. Sorry, 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 Max. You can continue. Please. <laughs> uh, I just I just wanted to note here that Orbis has uh, a certain way of dealing with proving execution uh, be correct. And they do it by, I forget the name of the C compiler. Uh, it's something about the micro CPU or something. Es essentially be um, ZK provable. Meaning that you can just prove that the execution was correct in a succinct way on chain. So that, that's how they deal with it. Um, in this particular case, uh, how about say uh, something like, uh, you know, the trusted execution environments or TEEs uh, and having them guarantee, um, okay, having them guarantee uh, the execution of programs. So uh, I mean, for example, if you look at the if you look at the Intel chipsets nowadays, right? You have got this, or even in the mobile phones, you have got this secure space or second space, which is like a, um, a uh, an enclave, a software enclave, which sort of guarantees that uh, there's no outside interference that can happen. Is uh, would that be something which could help prove the correct execution of um, programs? Well, that, I think that will uh, ensure that no that space, memory space is not accessed by any other process and you can, okay, it cannot be tampered anyway. Mm. And to prove the execution 
to prove oh, that actually, the program is not malicious would be still. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that opens the debate of open hardware, right? Because it's, uh, you, you, we are trusting vendors nowadays. We are yeah. trusting uh, the um, ring zero is uh, proprietary and we just execute things there but we cannot even be sure if they are not, uh, I don't know, cloning uh, stuff and you know throwing it through their radio interface to wherever location that that's uh, that's something that has, uh, happened uh, with super microservers in the past where in the supply chain of the servers there was a chip inserted in the motherboard so they use a data vector uh, for I don't yeah, remember yeah. what so unless we we have open hardware uh, and we build the open hardware local uh, physically uh, close enough to the execution environment of uh, we cannot have like I, I think we cannot have that level of assurance of the execution being you know 100% secure or, or correct um, okay. I think we have one oh, last question, which I'd really like to, uh, which I'd really like to get cleared is, uh, Juan but Sierra but asked about- I'm sorry to intervene. I'm sorry to intervene. Bernard is also joined and he That's would like to okay. ask questions. So I've added him as a panelist. Hi, so hi, Bernard. Just unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Unmute yourself, Bernard. Uh, I wonder, is he able to? You can unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Now I think you're unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the first thing I would like to support very much from the speakers that I came to and I listened to is we should not copy Ethereum what we see failing. If Ethereum's failures are caused by templates, and the correct research is done. And we see that these templates are leading to so many problems, leading to huge sums lost. I fully support you. Let's not go that route, because at least we have got a, a simple way of seen failing. I support that. I also support being unique. Uh, it was also one of those templates to say, well, in Ethereum, we used to get solidity. And in one day, I created a smart contract. Then I deployed it on testnet. The following week, I sent it to Open Zeppelin. They passed it. Then I, I put it on the uh, uh, mainnet. Uh, I had that feeling also. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I really... See, sometimes Cardano has got people who are very bold to say, no, for us, this is the way. We formally prove it this way. And we, it's deterministic, it's robust, scalable. Uh, this one, I, I repeat again, and I'll repeat to IOHK. Do not throw away something mathematically and scientifically proved is the correct way. Even if the whole world a fight to say, no, then you are not going to get lots of followers, lots of investors, what, what, what. Mark followed their own style and allowed Windows to float on the world with a lot of bugs in Windows. Mm -hmm. And today, Mark, with its price, his premium quality investors and buyers and users. So that is why I'm saying, if uh, you lead us, have proved and you are certain from scientific research, mathematical research, you have got the best. And this best would be diluted if we try to copycat these other uh, uh, tools that have failed. I'm going to say, stay your way. The world, time will tell that you are right. You are not here to please anyone. Um, that is one Bernard. thing. I, I just wanted to ask, uh, what was the question that you had? Uh, the question here, uh, the, which was asked, was about templates. Okay. That was a question. I have asked it too, also, and it has always been coming along. 
And uh, the respond, uh, is it uh, Max Millen who responded that way? Uh, maybe it was his personal opinion or what, but uh, that is why I was thinking if something is provable, it's deterministic and it's right, it's mathematically proven and it's safe. Uh, at the moment, on our community, we are struggling with a lot of uh, the learning curve is very steep. And uh, on the 7th of this month, I attended a town hall room on Bluetooth. I think some of you were here. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the things that were presented to us about a, a developers on Bluetooth. Four pillars of developer experience. Uh, the first one was perform depth operations at scale. Second one was reduce time to depth zero to hero in one day. So my question is, how do we do this uh, if we don't go the template way? Uh, Thank, thanks, thanks for the question. Yeah, I thanks think Bernard is raising yeah. a very important discussion point, which I think so, needs a separate discussion as it is, looks like a very uh, interesting question he's coming up with, right? We need to take it as a separate point of conversation for the benefit of time for us. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, I guess uh, maybe a quick answer to Bernard, anyone? Um, how do we... How, how can we do this? Does it even make sense to have a zero to hero in one day kind of in thing? Way. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I, what, what's your opinion? Join Just Amergo. Just close quickly. Take the Amergo program. <laughs> there's, uh, there's no, uh, I mean, writing, fine. It, a big focus in Solidity is the zero to hero in one day mentality. You know, you want to be able to write code as quickly as possible. Uh, for the same reason, I, there's a consensus among uh, professional developers in the Cardano community that we don't like templates. Uh, it's the same thing from this this sort of mentality of making it super, super easy, making everything as easy as possible. The focus should not be making the developer, ex uh, eventually we want tooling to make things smooth, but uh, the focus should not be on making the development experience as easy as possible. It should be making it as correct as possible, as especially when yeah, writing absolutely. financial applications you know this isn't like we're writing a game or, or doing homework people's yeah. you know it's like building a flight them. it's like building a commercial yeah. flight uh, tens of uh, maybe yeah. hundreds of thousands of people are trusting their lives with you yeah uh, further uh, I, would like I, share... I would say here that the ethereum ecosystem has had years ahead of mm. cardano and they have already figured exactly why why how and where to do thing, certain things and here on cardano we're still struggling to find the uh, basic patterns of design and how mm. should we even structure our dApps. It makes no sense to focus currently on ease of development. Well, it, it makes some sense to introduce more people to help with the process and, and strides are being made in this regard as well. There's a fun, fun initiative uh, project, Helios. Uh, also, people at Icon Language uh, are doing TX Pipe. All those initiatives are aimed at improving the ease, not necessarily the correctness. And, and that's a brilliant thing. We much appreciate it. However, uh, true focus on ease of use will can only come after we figured everything out. After we've had a few more years of time to develop, see, reflect on uh, certain decisions, how it should be structured, second wave products coming out, DAOs, successful, unsuccessful. It's going to be a long journey. Yeah. I, I think also this was a great question uh, ultimately asked by Bernard. Yeah, Philip? Uh, there's also Imperator, uh, which is similar to Helios, another, another option for ease of use. Um, but for ETS. the same reason, like, at one point, Charles said he picked Haskell when asked why he picked it. Because... Are you the creative of Imperator? No. Okay. I just mentioned okay. that uh, it's another option on top of Helios. I think it's Catalyst funded now, and they got some stuff going. But I, I think they're in Catalyst this round. 
Oh, okay. I was I was just asking because I accidentally uh, made the creative of Imperator sad once when I told him that I don't like the, the language. <laughs> and now I feel I'm bad. Uh, I think uh, Bharat, towards the end, I think towards the end, we would like to have an opportunity where we wish Maxi, Philip, and Roberto we ask each other one question which they would have loved to ask if they were in such a platform, right? That would be the last portion of our... <laughs> That's an interesting... Yeah, I think that's an interesting been, twist. <laughs> yeah, because we've been hearing that always each other, the three of them wanted to meet each other. That's what we've been hearing. So, in <laughs> we would like to ask, what is it that uh, one question you would like to ask each other as a question on this dais before we uh, hmm. ramping up the session? Right? Sage level questions. <laughs> yeah, let's start with uh, Maxi. What would you like to ask Roberto or Philip uh, being in that space? What is the one question you would like to ask them both? Okay, why don't we go in a circle and then back? Because you know, there's two people to ask one question each. So I'm going to start with uh, with Philip because I came up with a question for him first. Because he, also I'm dealing with a lot of auditors, so that's that's a question I have and always been wondering. Uh, it's also a funny one. So uh, let's start with this one. How much would a protocol live on testnet or, or not? Not even on testnet on mainnet. Um, would need to have in, in resources for you to when you d discover a um, vulnerability that could net you their entire or even part of sufficiently large amount of funds for you to start considering just going for it. A long question, Maxi. <laughs> yeah. So I, I basically, basically yeah. how, how much for you to black? Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I, yes. I often think about this. Huh. In fact, I discussed this with Barat when uh, they were asking, when we were designing the Emergo Professional Developer Program, they were asking for some Plutus smart contract examples. And I gave them the ADA loan smart contract, a a AADA. It's like a lending platform contracts. Yeah, and they recently launched. They had like an open source um, bounty audit. Yeah, audit and bounty. And I think Musili Swap did the same thing. But the the prize for Musili Swap finding a critical vulnerability was like something like five k or or like that. And I, you think if someone finds a vulnerability, <laughs> are they going to take five k or are they going to take like you know, the <laughs> entire question back. of Musili Swap? So, I mean, I don't, personally, I don't think I, because I'm KYC and everywhere, I don't think I'd ever black hat, but, but for the average person, I think they're taking the 500K instead of the 5K. So Maxi, is it, is it, uh, is it a well answer? Uh, uh, is it acceptable? That's a good, a good enough answer. It's a me, safe answer, <laughs> but no. Thank you. He did answer. Yeah. So what's your next question, Roberto? Okay, so uh, I will connect my my question with a uh, thought that I had right before. Um, so Simon Thompson, the creator of Marlowe, or the lead for Marlowe, uh, envisioned the future uh, where more and more DSL or very specific uh, languages emerge so you can build different uh, contracts without maybe having the knowledge of, um, I mean, having developer skills even. Um, and I think that that could be the zero to hero way for for some people um, at some specific project. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, them both how how do you see those DS DSLs or those building blocks on top of Bluetooth Core evolving? Do you think it's it's gonna be the case, or we are gonna be Haskelling forever? Oh, interesting question, both to Maxi and Philip. Anytime, anytime. I think I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of, of Merlot and that type of architecture because a lot of it being even more domain specific than Plutus, because Plutus is already a DSL. Uh, once you get super domain specific, like you have a specific type of smart contract that you want to create a DSL for, you can already pre prevent a lot of the problems that exist in general. Uh, smart contract programming. So you can stop developers from making a lot of mistakes a and even more so with graphical programming languages. So uh, yeah, hopefully we get to a point where people can just pull up Merlot and and create 
simple applications, all, you know, in a day. How was it, Roberto? Cool. I think I, I dream of the day where we can, you know, build a contract that uh, if you press a verifiable credential, it will open a door and stuff like that. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Thanks for sharing that. Philip, what's your question to either of them? The last question of the whole session. Would you like to ask either of them anything specific? To uh, yeah. So um, what are you, we were talking about um, off um, KYC solutions and uh, IOHK's proposal uh, slash against like other on-chain mechanisms. Uh, is there anything that particularly interests you guys like uh, Atala or uh, what is it, Block Pass? Who's going first, Roberto or Maxime? Uh, uh, I, I'm a big fan of what Roots ID uh, team is doing uh, regarding SSI, uh, hopefully through SSI where we can even get rid of central authorities that expedite our identities and we can start building our own and, you know, building by, by accumulating merits, building a reputation and creating this through uh, abstract uh, sense of identity, I would say. That's... How about you, Maxi? What's your thought on this? Deep in thought. Yeah, the, I think that self-sovereign identity is an incredibly important concept and if it were to be implemented properly uh, then it would be wonderful however uh, there are many areas to towards which people wish to use it now that i don't believe will make uh, a lot of sense to use it for say for example a credit credit score i don't think it's a, the best idea uh, given that it is either insufficient or in, even worse than the current credit score systems, uh, unless, again, we go through hoops and make it exactly the same. Uh, I'm overall positive, used to, <laughs> uh, but it go, could go very easily like the opposite way, where uh, <laughs> digital identity tr truly becomes the end time. <laughs> yeah, uh, at the end times, the invisible hand, uh, you know, the end uh, of... Big Brother uh, will watch you perfectly. Exactly, exactly. But, 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 but you know, uh, uh, <laughs> there's more catalysts to make that happen. Um, but then it's not... And at that point, it wouldn't even be self-sovereign. So uh, kind of defeats the point of talking about SSI with that context in mind. So that's my answer here. Also, I would like to briefly answer the previous question because because we can, because <laughs> uh, but I do just echo and the answer of my fellow speaker. I am positive about more languages coming to uh, Cardano, being able to write certain dApps in it. But ultimately, there's going to be a level of complexity that's not really able to be kind of jumped over. Wow, well, I think, uh, Philip, you, you're, 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 wait, 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 there's a buzzer around here, just wait. I think there's one person waiting for the buzzer. Uh, okay. So Philip, I think, Philip, hope uh, you, you, you're you okay with the answer, or you would like to do a little more with Maxi and Roberto? Done. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, that was great. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Philip, thanks. I think Jonah has been waiting with a buzzer question. One. Yes, one, yeah, I have one question. Is a yes or no from uh, our, our three experts here. Um, and it's relation, the relationship is to um, what happened when Sunday Swap first launched and someone sort of had access to the contract and submitted a transaction before anybody else. Um, if somebody's to do something like that, if you are, if someone is to access a smart contract uh, in a way that's not intended by the user, is that considered an exploit? Yes or no from each one of you? Oh, it's only a yes or no, no explanations. Only, only yes, yes or no. Could you yes. ask it again? Just, just, oh. just to make yeah. certain. Question again. 
if a user is to submit a transaction to a smart contract in a way that was not intended by the uh, initial designer of the smart contract, is that considered, in your opinion, an exploit or not? By to sending, you mean literally creating an output locked to a validator that's part of your protocol? Correct. Then no, I don't consider that a vulnerability. No. Yeah, then, Philip. Yeah, I said no. No. And it, yeah. I said yes. Wow, oh. we liked it. So I think this requires a follow on session where we have to debate on yes versus two, no. Thanks for guys. I think a uh, couple go back to you on the presentation. Just another sure. minute. Yeah. So another, I think we need a little minute where for us to launch our Discord channel which we have created for the Cardano developers, which we would like to launch in this event. So let's go back and maybe I think there is a couple of news from the Academy, which we would like to share with the people. So here comes a very important aspect of Academy, which is like the Cardano Solutions Architect program launched. No shortcut. I think Philip uh, brought up this conversation. We have launched this. Uh, maybe we have looked at the video once. I yep. think you need to enable the audio. Yeah, we are unable to hear the audio. We take this opportunity to thank all the industry experts who collaborated with Bharat to make us do a real world interesting course, which is going to really be very, very interesting, niche and useful for all the Plutus developers, the Cardano solutions architect, right? And uh, taught by experts from the industry, which is a panel of people looking forward. Some of them are here out in this conversation. So we've already launched the first cohort. We are very happy that we are able to bring our Cardano courses progressively from the Cardano overview, the Cardano developer associate, the Cardano developer professional, and in our journey today, we are on the Cardano solutions architect course. We are very happy. Congratulations to the entire Emergo family for having got this launched. As we well as all the people who have helped us to, you know, yes, yes. Ref define and refine this program yes. to where it is today. Including Philip, Dr. Lars. Many people, many people um, in our journey who has taken us to this. And any queries or questions, you can always write to Vina at Amargo.io. We just wanted to open it out today. The first cohort has been very happy to receive this course. And the second from the Academy, a short, quick uh, update is that the next extreme course is that how could somebody, yeah, this is the launched. Can we go to the next presentation? How could somebody understand what is required to go into the solutions architect? What is required, right? Look at the MR code developer capsule bootcamp, bootcamp, right? It's a 24 hour where anybody steps in, gets to know what are the essentials for becoming a first developer? What are they, a bootcamp, right? For you to make a decision, what is my path? How should I pick up a direction? And interestingly launched a precursor to our Cardano professional series, right? And obviously, to ensure that the foundational program with the Cardano overview reaches many more, it is being done at a very subsidized program at a dollar hundred. So these are some of the happenings happening in the academy part, which we want to definitely share it to our community members. Yeah. Whoever, whichever ways you feel it important for you all, please reach out to Vina. I think, uh, Meenakshi, I would like to say here that, uh, you know, the Emergo Developer Capsule Bootcamp, it's sort of like the, well, not zero to hero, but zero to uh, 20. <laughs> zero to 20 out of uh, zero to 30 out of 100 maybe right so yes. it's just a capsule which will help you understand what's the overall picture on uh, how do you get into cardano what are the things you have to really love about cardano what are the things you have to really struggle with or you know which you really have to build your muscles with and learning all that and understanding what you're getting into when you're getting into the cardano development uh, ecosystem so this is the the aim behind the cardano uh, the developer capsule bootcamp Thank you, Bharat. Thanks for giving a quick gist about it. Uh, so Emergo is becoming one side. We are going forward, launching courses much ahead of the need. 
On the other side, we are also backtracking and ensure that people get into the trail. So the boot camp is one example of that, and Solutions Architect is another example of it, right? So that's a little coming up from Academy, which we wanted to share here. Moving on to the next presentation. Next slide, Kapit. Yes, now comes our tech lead of the Discord channel, who is going to launch the over to Pereira. Sebastian Pereira, please go ahead and launch your Discord channel. And um, probably the slide, slide has to be shared. Kapil, yes. please share the slide and uh, give an audio and uh, video for Pereira. Kapil, can you share the slide? Pereira, can you just what? check if you are able to switch on your video? Kindly share the slide. Sure, one minute. Pereira, can you switch on yourself and speak? Are you able to? The next slide, please. Hear me? Yeah. Okay. Next slide, Kapil. Next slide, Kapil. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Pereira. Oh. Yours. Yeah, hello. Uh, I cannot. Ah, there it is. So, hello. You are everyone. there. Come on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, thank you for giving this opportunity. So from the Murgo Academy community, we are launching a dedicated Discord channel for uh, technical questions, questions regarding uh, Haskell, questions regarding Bluetooth development, questions regarding uh, how to connect front end with the, with the smart contract, how to spin up a note and all of that stuff. Uh, I'll be there to help with those questions. Uh, hopefully not only me, right? If, if there is something I cannot answer, then I will ask the faculty at the Murgo. We, we, we have a lot of members, so it will be a, a collaborative project. But yes, please, uh, any anything you have, you, you just go there and we'll try to find a solution together. And I think that way we, we can grow the community even more. So thank you for this opportunity. And thank congratulations, you for, Pereira. For I think congratulations for launching your next ex exclusive Discord channel. I think the first one was for the Project Catalyst proposers related to Project Catalyst. The second one, you're coming with the Cardano uh, for the developers. Love to have all the developers on this channel, which will have the subject matter experts on Haskell, Plutus, various aspects to be a part of this channel. And definitely the proposers and the team would be uh, could use it uh, effectively. And yes, with that, you can all join the link. I would request Philip, Roberto, Maxi, all to be a part of this group so that we can continue your conversations now that our community has seen you. They have a lot more questions to continue. So we could ha have those questions out here, right? Over to the next presentation. Uh, sorry, where's the link? Where's the Discord invite? Yes. Um, yeah. It's in the chat. Uh, Kapil, can you just share that in the chat? Yeah, yes, I think he has shared please. it in the chat. So it's already there in the chat. Uh, I can't access the chat. Oh, oh it's it? like okay. really slow. Oh, I okay, can, I can, I can. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so it. now all of you can join the community uh, in general where we can have all these events, conversation, Project Catalyst Discord channel is out there, Cardano Developer Discord channel is out here. Please be a part of all these things and get benefited. Emergo Academy community would, would love to be in these conversations and discussions with all of you. Here yes, to I want to reiterate what Manashki said. Uh, everybody, please uh, join these communities for uh, more information to support uh, Cardano uh, ecosystem in general. Um, this is where you'll find out about all the great things that we're doing here at Emergo Academy. Um, this is where we can connect with each other. We can uh, form new ideas, uh, build these tools that we're all trying to uh, use and uh, continue to develop uh, here on Cardano. So I, I please uh, ask everyone to join uh, these communities. Uh, Help us get to that 2,500 plus member. Uh, we would love to uh, get these numbers through the roof. And again, I wanna thank uh, our guests for being here today. Um, Maximilian, Roberto, Philip, thank you so much uh, for taking this time out of your busy schedules um, to share your thoughts and information and ideas with us. Um, it's extremely valuable to us um, as learners. Um, you know, in the Cardano ecosystem, we're trying, some of us here are trying to develop dApps um, understanding these best practices that you guys have provided to us today uh, has been very informative. And I just want to say thank you one more time uh, from the whole community and from myself. Thank you very much for joining us. Yes. So just to add one last, one last point. So we would love if any of you wish to be a part of our uh, community and become ambassadors and take all these conversations to different part of the globe, right? We see LATAM, we see different places from where we're getting all these networks. Wherever you feel you would want Emergo Academy community to be along with you and you wish to be a part of us, please, those people, we request you to write to my mail ID. And if there is any collaboration which anybody wants to do with Academy, because 
we see that a lot of pro project proposers have gone for uh, many of the academic or learning solutions. You need any support, please do write to all these email IDs and we'll be there along with you all uh, facilitating whatever support we could do for you all, right? Take this note to thank definitely uh, Maxi, uh, Roberto, Philip, to be have been a part of this. Hope you really enjoyed the session along with us. It was awesome. We would continue to have specific conversations along with you. Thanks to Bharat having brought this discussion so well, so nicely, because there were close to 56, 60 questions. From there, we had to see <laughs> how many can we take in the 75 minutes allocated. So somewhere, how many ever we could take it up, we have done it. We would continue to do this, right? Uh, thanks to the steering committee of the MRB Academy community, Jonah, uh, Pereira, Kapil, Sachin, uh, Pabin, uh, awesome. I think, uh, thanks a lot for bringing this to such a point. I think together we are making uh, interesting things happen, which is gonna benefit the Cardano ecosystem very, very much, right? So with this note, thanks to Emergo Management, Emergo Academy, and all my colleagues who have, have been together to put up this show from the last uh, 20, 25 days. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot. See you all in the next event of Emergo Academy. Have a great Thank you, attendees. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, guys. It was a great talk. Thank you all for having us.